60 feet, six inches, right? The greatest one-on-one -on -one confrontation in all of sport. How would you describe the Portland Pickles playing style? Like you mentioned, we started playing our type of baseball. What is Portland Pickles baseball? Can you describe what it means to have a two-strike approach? Yeah. You ever played wiffle ball in your backyard? Oh yeah. Okay. And your buddy's got you 0-2 and he's going to, he's going to throw you whatever he's going to throw you right. And you're going, there's no way in hell this guy's striking me out, right? Cause he's not going to start pumping his fist and yelling at me. <laughs> We were, I think they're running a documentary on us. I can't remember who it's for. I talked with them. Yeah. What was your experience with that throughout the season? And did you notice the cameras there when they were there? Or did you just go about it as, as is? What are the future plans for Coach Mags? I'm 43 into my, going into my 43rd season. First pitch to Connor Stewart. Swung on. Slow roller to short. Bobble by the shortstop. Rod comes in. The Pickles win. Your Pickles are the 2024 West Coast League champion. Welcome back to the Couch GM Podcast. Today we have on Coach Mags, head coach of the Portland Pickles, fresh off of their first ever West Coast League Championship as a franchise. Coach Mags was also named the West Coast League Coach of the Year for 2024. We talked through a lot of baseball topics, through his story on how he started in baseball, how he became the head coach for the Pickles, Clark College, and much more. This podcast is sponsored by Black Label Supplements. They're my go-to for all things supplementation, whether it's pre-workout, post-workout, creatine, BCAAs, you name it. Go check out blacklabelsupplements.com. They are a third-party tested, athlete-approved supplement company. Use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And as always, if you're thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing a property in the Pacific Northwest, make sure to reach out to myself, the Couch GM. My full-time career is as a mortgage broker, assisting clients with their mortgage financing needs, because every sports fan needs to find a living room of their own to watch their favorite team on their big screen. You can visit brokerconnorweb.com or my contact information will be in the description of this video. And with that, let's get into the podcast. So many people that have had tough times, and so to talk through everyone's experience, well, I think that's why baseball um, parallels life so much, because it's about failure, right? In, li failure. in li life, if you're, if you're trying to do something, and you're trying to be great at something, you're going to fail. And it's if you're okay. not failing, you're probably doing something wrong. It's okay to you fail. You need to push yourself. Failure is not defining. It's how you, how you rebound from fail. That defines who you are. And you're going to have many defining moments in your life. Not just one. There's going to be a ton of them. Right. Right. So you, you, the, you, your life every day is a defining moment. Yeah. It is what it is. You know, so, I mean, hey, championships aren't easy to get. We got one, but they're, and I wouldn't call a season a failure if you, if you don't win it, but there's been a lot of disappointments along the way. Right. Mm -hmm. So that one was sort of fun. Yeah. I mean, hey, I like, I like building relationships and having fun. Yeah. That's what, that's what about, man. It, it, it's fun. Yeah. Like when I started this two and a half years ago, I'm sure he, he would say the same, but. I had no idea that we'd be at this point and just the relationships and the connections that I've been able to make because people kind of see what I'm doing and just like I mentioned how I'm genuine with it and I'm trying to really grow the game and share stories and where it goes and take it one step at a time. It's like anything else. Like it, life is too short. Like the story that, you know, there's a, there's a t-shirt oh, that we're talking, I'm just giving you a backstory, but there's a t-shirt that people have that says free mags, right? I got kicked out of a game. I don't know if you saw it. <laughs> If you, if you look it up online, it's pretty funny. You look up minor league manager kicks umpire out twice. You might want to look at that. Kicks umpire, umpire, umpire out, out twice. And if you look at it before the story, it's a good story, by the way. So I'm on the bus and we're in a charter. Mosley, Mosby from, uh, from UCSB comes up and goes, Mags, you're on Barstool. Barstool, right? What are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't know what Barstool was, right? Yeah. Um, he goes, no, no, you're, 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 on, you're on this, you're on that. And I go, What? So I look down and I'm on bar stool. I'm on I'm on everything you can see, and I and I eventually I got suspended, right? Because it got so big, I think that's why they suspended me. And so they made a shirt that said "Free Mags of Pickles." Did Alan Miller and and the powers to be made it? But at that time, I said, "Hey, if we're going to sell this shirt, can we give proceeds to the Fisher family?" My guy Grant Fisher was killed by a guy on meth in Portland at 6:30 in the morning. He had graduated from Western Oregon. He had a baby girl just gotten married baby was maybe a couple of months old. And, um, so that was, we raised money for him. So that's a story where, you know, you got kicked out, but every day, cause Fisher wears 27, I wore 27 with the pickles and with, with, uh, Clark, he played for me at Clark because 
that they the family lets me use that number. They retired it, and uh, so every morning, Monday through Friday, I do 127 push-ups because there's only 127, right? So it is about relationship building, right? So so I talk to them every day. Um, but uh, and even when I was sick, I asked. I was really sick after a couple of days ago. I looked up and I said, "Man, I don't know if I can do this today." So I, give me a day off. So I I moved from t- from Monday. I missed Monday, so I'm, I I got through Tuesday. I got through yesterday. I got through about seven. I got through seventy today. Um, so I'm going to try to finish them up before the day's up. But and then I'll just go into Saturday. But Monday through Friday, I say hi to fish. So it's always about relationships and stories. Yeah, you know so. Wow. If you got a second, look that one up. Look up minor league manager kicks umpire out twice. You will die <laughs> laughing. I promise you. That's amazing. Manager. So you were coaching at Clark when that we, happened. Yeah, I I got this. I got the. Um, and how many I years was, ago did that happen? Oh God, I don't even want to. I don't even want to remember. Here, I'm gonna show you. <laughs> I do remember seeing a headline of that, and I'm sure I watched yeah, it when it came up. You will. I'll let you see this. This is a. I can put it on the screen. Yeah, you'll yeah, like let's it. Let's do it. Okay. Pull it up, Jamie. <laughs> are we having fun yet yeah <laughs> here it is right here yeah yep. go ahead <laughs> are you i was walking into bars and people were putting pickles in my drinks there's number one <laughs> oh you threw them out twice okay <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think I, I yeah. Have you ever kicked dirt on an ump? Um, I've covered home plates. This is, <laughs> this is the other one. Um, this is what I did for Grant. It was during COVID, so this is why I can show this to you. You might want to see this one. If you pull up, could you pull up something else for me? Sure. This is when he. This is when he um, passed. Yes, when he died. Oh right, the, the memorial. Okay. Yeah, so we were in COVID and. Uh, I wrote his I wrote his eulogy, which I'm going to give at the stadium later on. But it was that's what it was. I mean, so that's that's a I mean that's a that's one of the biggest losses ever, right? And especially when you you see what he left behind, and then you see that the, I think the judge gave the guy eight and a half years, right? I mean, I mean, go figure. What, were you kidding me? Yeah. You know, I'm Grant Fisher's baseball coach, and later I became his friend. This is for the Fisher family. For as long as I can remember, I've explained to young men that in life, you've got to take the bad with the good, the crookeds with the straights. You're going to have bad days and you're going to have great days. Life is going to give you pain. Life is going to give you joy. You've got to take the crookeds with the straights. The crooked that the Fisher family and friends were handed is indescribable. The painful loss and its memory will last a lifetime. We understand that we must accept the crookeds, that we must have inner peace because someday we know we will get the straights. Grant Fisher knew Jesus, so I'm sure that Fish's wife, Caitlin, his daughter, Ella Grace, his parents, Laura and Adam, his brother, Alex and Ruby, and all of us, someday will see our teammate in a place so perfect that it will be indescribable. We will see him in a place where the ballparks and the stadiums will remind us of cathedrals, where the aroma of hot dogs, Cracker Jack, and popcorn will fill the air. He will be pitching on a mound made of firm clay with the perfect slope. He will give the hitter some smoke at his yoke, followed by some cheese at his knees. There will be no pitching backwards, no trickery, just some good old-fashioned baseball and some good old-fashioned country fastballs. His infielders will defend on a surface made of grass and dirt, not turf. The infield mix will be drugged to perfection. It will be as smooth as God's ocean on a windless summer day. We will see him in a place where the hops are true, in a place that sacrifice is still respected, in a place where good pitching still beats good hitting. We will see him in a place where he will tow the rubber and give us the best that he has, just like he did as a husband, a father, a son, a brother, a teammate, a friend. Just like he did when he was a penguin and when he was my player. So rest assured that Grant got the call that every ball player dreams of. He got the call up. 
He's been promoted to the big leagues. God has put the game ball in his locker. And he couldn't have picked a better man. Dios te bendiga. God bless you. That's Grant Fisher. Man. Yeah, that's uh, very tough. I, I love that kid. Love him. Still do to this day. Talk to him Monday through Friday. And uh, yeah, so except when I take a day off, he gave me a day <laughs> off. I told Jody said, uh, because I have to get hernia surgery. She goes, I go, I still got to do my push ups. She goes, I'll talk to Grant. <laughs> so yeah, we can, we can bust out the remainder for today's after the podcast here. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, right now, if I get through 10, like I, I break them down, like if I'm in a hotel, I'll go like 50 and then I'll go 40. I try to, I just stagger them out. But when I was sick this past week, I was going like, okay, 20. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was hard. Just trying to get through it. Just getting through it, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Coach Max, thank you for coming on the podcast now that we've kind of officially started. Yeah, there we go. And uh thanks for having me. Yeah, really excited to hear, you know, more of your story and how you've gotten to this point, the story of the pickles. You know, you've already shared shared very touching story. So let's let's start with a bit of your story with how you got into to baseball and sports and you know how you got to this point where you're you're at today. I don't remember ever not being a baseball player. My brothers and my dad always were playing, and uh, there's just pictures of me at five years old and catching gear. Uh, I, I tell my wife all the time, Jody, that uh, I don't remember ever having a birthday and not being in a baseball uniform. So uh, since since I was little, I always wanted to be a baseball player. Who doesn't want to be a baseball player? I grew up wanting to be a cowboy or a baseball player, right? And that's what you want to be. Um, and, uh, you know, just basically, you know, I was at school, and um, I – one day I walked into Donnie Adams math class at Carpinteria middle school. And I said, Hey, can I come coach a venture college after I was done playing? And, uh, that's how it started. You know, I thought I was going to be a lawyer and, uh, it didn't come out. It didn't work out that way. Mm -hmm. Baseball coach since, uh, 1983. Okay. So, so you play, did, did your father get you into baseball initially? Yeah. yeah my dad was one of the co-founders of a little league in Satikoy, California. You won't find it on the map. It's outside of Ventura, right there on the on the ocean. Um, so he was one of the founders there. So we've always been around baseball my entire life. Um, my mom and dad, obviously huge in my life. Uh, my biggest my biggest heroes, my mom and my dad. I watched them work and and raise a, a big family. So it was it was fun to to be around them. Not all the time, right? Because they're parents, mm -hmm. <laughs> and my parents were tough and and disciplinarians. So I uh, had to toe the line, and I had five older brothers. So you towed the line, or your brothers to let you know. Was there some good competition between the brothers? I was, um, so we were like the uh, Brady Bunch. Uh, my mom and dad got together and put two families together. And then I came later. So my brothers were older than I was. So they, I always looked up to them. And from, from all my brothers, I learned something. You know, I've got a brother, uh, one of my brothers, uh, Melton, is a Ventura County Hall of Famer uh, coach. My other brothers, Ronnie, Ray had great careers in business and my brother Richard, God bless him now, he's gone. He was a musician and my brother Kenny I was an educator, you know, he's got a PhD. So my parents did a good job of raising us and putting us in the right direction. Yeah. So then you get in, it sounded like you knew that you weren't going to be playing past high school. I played college, played at Westmont College in okay. Santa Barbara. Um, I, I wasn't a great player. I was a good player. And I think I just, uh, I, just being competitive, um, I, I, got, I, I was able to play you know, past high school. And, uh, when it was over, um, I had great relationships and I loved the game and I couldn't see myself wearing a suit and tie every day. So, uh, that's what I did. Put on some, uh, baseball pants and cleats. Yeah. Get, get back I, out there. Hey, I, I, I still get to go to work most, you know, 10 months of the year, 11 months of the year and put on a baseball uniform. Yeah. I mean, how, how many people want to do that? I, yeah. I, I get to put on stirrups, pants, belt, put on a hat and I get to spit. It's fun <laughs> as heck. Chew seeds, chew gum, whatever. Yeah, now I chew seeds and chew gum, right? But <laughs> yeah. In the old days, I was chewing, like, before it became, you don't do it anymore, right? I was I was always having something in my mouth, right? Quick tangent. When did you first hear about Big League Chew? Did you chew Big League Chew? I heard about it probably when it first came out, uh, and I did chew it, but I used it differently than other, than other players probably did. I used it to wrap my bread man in. My tobacco. Okay. <laughs> so I would chew the big man, big league chew, get it nice from where I wanted to do, and then I'd wrap up my chew when I chewed. I don't chew anymore. Okay. Yeah. So I used it differently. Yeah. But that's a true story. Okay. So awesome. 
No, yeah, that's funny because I had the big the founder of Big League Chew on the podcast recently. I bet so. him. I okay, bet him. good good guy. He's from Portland. Yeah, yes, it was at a Portland Pickles game where one of my friends ended up meeting him. Yeah, yeah. good guy, great guy. Uh, met him I think before the pandemic because he used to bring samples or, or bring stuff or come see us, especially when we had Mavericks night. We we honored the Mavericks a yeah. while a long time ago, but I think it was before the pandemic, and he was out there. Good guy. Yeah. So you get into co- uh, coaching college. Mm-hmm. What was the transition like for you going from player to now having to coach and, and help players grow? I think I was looking back on it. I, I think you always come out thinking you know everything and then not until later do you realize you don't know anything. Uh, so I think I wasn't a very good coach for a long time. Um, and I think my enthusiasm probably kept me above water. That was it. I was always enthusiastic. I wanted to be on the stadium. I always enjoyed coming to the stadium and going to work and getting to ball games. I think young coaches now want to be head coaches or be the boss really fast. Uh, if you look at my career, I spent most of my years as a um, head head assistant or an assistant coach or a hitting instructor or something like that. I think you got to apprentice. I don't think you can just come out and, and all of a sudden you think you know how to teach because coaching is just teaching. Mm-hmm. Your classroom happens to be either in a, in a classroom setting or on the field, but we're ultra competitive too. So you're a teacher who is an ultra competitor, right? You want the very best. So you you don't come out playing and say, hey, I'm, I'm ready for this. I mean, there's a lot of things you need to learn. I mean, you, you got to handle people. There's, there's social sides to coaching. There's psychological sides to coaching, not just the X's and O's. Uh, so it's good to apprentice. Let's think about it. A plumber apprentices, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. I mean, pe- people people learn their trade. It's a trade. Take your time and do it right. Don't take shortcuts. Uh, I think the first time I got my head job was a high school job, Santa Paula High School. And I was a young guy. And my bench coach was named Art Reichel, uh, UCLA Hall of Famer, NCA Hall of Famer. He's my bench coach, right? He's retired. That's dumb, right? So, um, and I was horrible. I wasn't a very good coach. I, I I just didn't know what I didn't know. And looking back on it, I just think, I thank God that that coach Reichel was there. Um, he, he told me, he taught me a great story. One day we were getting our backsides kicked and he said, sometimes you just got to take the e-ticket and go for a ride. So for you guys that are too young to understand what an e-ticket is, it's Disneyland. <laughs> okay. right? So when we grew up in Disneyland in the sixties and seventies, they still had ticket packages. And like, let's say ticket A had all like the small world, the teacups, all those, the, the rides that nobody wants to go on. But the E-ticket had the Pirates of the Caribbean, right? It had uh, space, it was a space mountain back there, the Matterhorn, right? It had the good ride. So he would say, sometimes you got to just take the E-ticket and go for the ride because there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. So um, I say that to young coaches now. So when things aren't going well, I said, this might be the day you take the E-ticket. So you've got to learn to do things the right way. And you just can't learn under one person. I've been blessed. I learned under Coach Reichel, Coach Anglin, Coach Adams. Um, you know, Rich Hill's played a big part in my life. Andy Lopez has been a big part of it. I mean, in little ways. They they probably don't even know. Guys that John Kurtgaard, guys that I just watched from afar or that I played with or that I've worked camps with. Um, I've been very fortunate. And those are just a few of the men that uh, um, I've idolized, not idolized, but I've respected. And, um, and, and from afar, or even if we have friendships. So I just try to learn from as many people as possible. I think that's important for people that want to be coaches. Don't just settle, learn from, from as many people as you can take what you like, leave what you don't like, and then create your, create what you want to build. And when you're first getting into it, I'm sure you don't know like what your coaching style is or how you want to coach. And so by playing for various coaches, by learning from various coaches, you're able to kind of combine the goods, you know, take out the bads and create your own coaching style over time, I'd imagine. Yeah, you do. You create you create your 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 beliefs, what you what you believe in, what you want your program to be, what you want to be. I don't think you can change your personality though. Mm-hmm. My personality is different than other people's. Uh I'm outgoing, I'm loud, uh, and I like to I like to I like to coach with my voice. I like to I like to be energetic. And then when it comes to game time, I'm a firm believer that Players win and managers lose. My job is to prepare them for the game. So you prepare your class for the test, right? You mm-hmm. prepare them for the test, and then you let them go take the test. Well, they're prepared, and then my job is to keep them, keep them in a position to win in the seventh, eighth, or ninth inning and let players get it done. Uh, so I, I think that the calmness in the dugout is important, but I also think you need to be who you are at all times. And I, I, I'm really 
believe in practice. I love, I love work. I think you don't eat unless you work, right? That's the way it's supposed to go. You work, you eat. You don't work, you go hungry. So you work, you eat. You work, you win, right? Follow the process. So that's what you do. Yeah. So walk me through those, those next few years. You get into coaching in college. You start, you know, cutting your teeth in the coaching world. What are, what are the next years after that and that experience? You're poor. Uh, you know, you don't make any money. I think that's another thing that people think you're going to get out of college. You, you want to be a, you want to be a baseball coach. You want to do this. You want to do that. They start looking at a paycheck. Well, there's not a lot of money all the time and you have to, you have to really be disciplined and you really got to have, <laughs> you just got to be tough minded, man, because you're going to go hungry. Right. And for me, um, you know, I had a family, a young family, so it was really difficult. And I was blessed to have people around me that helped me get through it from my family, my mom, my dad, my brothers, uh, my wife. Um, you know, my wife now is amazing. Um, so, um, yeah, I've been blessed to have people around me, but you're going to go hungry. Don't think that the that baseball and coaching baseball is about making a lot of money at this level. It's just not. Mm -hmm. um, and you can ask any coach that started, you know, when we started, it's just not there. So you've got to be creative and you know, maybe start giving lessons, create a, create some type of plan outside so you can make ends work until you, you get a chance to get a steady income. Mm -hmm. As my dad would always say growing up, you know, beans and rice, rice and beans to try to save up and just, you know, get through the tough times. It, there's nothing better than beans and rice. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm a Mexican, right? My mom and dad, my mom would make homemade tortillas and, and she'd say, hey, we got a poor man's meal tonight. It'd be beans and rice. And I, I couldn't wait. Man. It's the best thing ever, man. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's best. Love it. Yeah. Minor league coaches currently make between twenty and sixty thousand dollars a year, and that's in twenty twenty four numbers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it, yeah, <laughs> it, looking at the numbers of it's ridiculous, and we can get into this and opinions on your thoughts of the major leagues, the stupid amount of money that that certain guys are making in general, and then you look at as we just described the minor leagues. You know, you're not you're you're working off of that that signing bonus if you got one to live off of and you're making hardly anything the living conditions have improved i've heard but it's a grind i mean as with anything when you're first starting out yeah and i think that's what we forget that it's it is a grind and in this age where you have everything at your fingertips young people have everything at their fingertips the grind isn't something people want which why is why people say baseball is not popular anymore because people don't really want to work Right. This is about work. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it parallels life so much. I mean, you, you've got to work for what you want and you're not going to get paid all, until you, you start going up those levels, uh, whether you're a player or a coach. So it's important to understand that that grind is part of baseball. It's it's it's, it's at our core. It's a game of failure. Uh, yeah. Lots you, of failures. If you succeed three out of 10 times, you're probably an all star. Absolutely. And you're making a lot of money. Yeah. Or you've got a scholarship someplace or you got a big NIL deal, right? Three out of 10. Right. So every hundred at bats, you're failing 70 times. You're walking back to the dugout empty handed. All right. So now for people that are trying to put this in perspective, think about your life as an adult. Okay. You, you, get, you get away from college, get out of college, you get out of high school, whatever it is in your life, you're married, you're not married. How many times did you fail? How many days were not productive or days that you didn't, you, your goal wasn't reached. That's, that's life, right? So baseball parallels life. And it's about how quickly you can get over that last failure onto the next thing. And thinking forward, if you keep, you know, sitting on your laurels and thinking about what just happened, you know, those are the people that don't last in the game. So I'll get up early in the morning and my wife will say, Hey, what are you doing? I'm going, I'm going to work because nobody else is working yet. I want to work because I want to beat somebody at something, even though they don't know they're competing against me. I want to beat them in my mind. I want to beat them at the morning. I want to have the first call to the East Coast if I'm recruiting for the Pickles to know that I beat somebody in the West Coast League that morning. And w whether I did or I didn't, in my mind, I know I did, mm -hmm. right? They don't know I did, but I know I did. And that sounds crazy. Like during the pandemic, my son, Ryan, uh, and I were having steps and I was kicking his butt every day because we were competing every day. So one day he walked in, it was about two in the afternoon and he had 9,000 steps. I have no idea where he went. And, and I was sitting at like four. I'm going, oh my God, I'm going to lose. So I 
put a backpack on, uh, grabbed my, my uh, headset and I went for a walk. I came back about three hours later with about 14,000 steps. And he goes, you just went for a walk to beat me? I go, absolutely. <laughs> Why wouldn't I want to beat you? I didn't want to listen to you all night telling me you kicked my backside, right? Yeah. I can cuss on this thing or not? Yeah. Okay. Part. I just thought I was going to say ass, but I don't know if I could or not. So yeah. I always going to let him kick my ass. Yeah. Yeah. I'm no, trying to be good. My wife said, don't cuss when I left the house. And I go, you guys don't have no idea how hard it is for me not to cuss. I can always edit if we want to take out just the audio yeah, you know, of yeah, that part. Yeah. I don't care. She's yeah. going to be the one going, you cussed. It's all good. Yeah. And a big shout out to Deb's Coffee Bar. They are the sponsor of this podcast. This is their podcast studio. If you are located anywhere around Southwest Washington, make sure to check out one of their three locations. And if you're a big coffee guy like I am, make sure to check out orderdevs.com. Use code COUCHGM for free shipping off your order. That, that's awesome. Yeah, competition. Um, and so going back to you get into to coaching and college and not making much money. It's a grind. It's a, it's a struggle. What were those next years after that and in uh, the next steps for you? I, I think that's always been a grind. I mean, um, you know, just going from job to job and always being blessed that when I'd go to, I'd go to the North or the Midwest for 10 years, I was in Colorado for 10 years um, and coming home, knowing that uh, coach Anglin and coach Adams and Ventura college always had a home for me. Right. They always kept bringing me back and I always loved being a pirate. So I always knew I had a, a home to go to um, and uh, going back there and it's a place I love and I always wish the best for Ventura College. And um, so I always knew I had a fallback. And I, so I it, I was always pushing the envelope as much as I could to try to just find that perfect fit. And I think that in the course of time, uh, what you saw is I've been to places where we've built programs, whether it's a high school program or I've went to help at a, at a, at a junior college or wherever I've been, we've just made the program better. We've, we've not I've, we've made the program better because it's a collective. It's always a collective. How was the recruiting process and when did you first become a head coach and then walk me through, you know, the process of building out your first roster, the recruiting process of trying to get guys to come play for you, all those things. I think when, you know, you recruit when you're a, when you're an assistant and that's, and you're always wanting people to come play for, for me or us. Um, cause that's the way you look at it. You come play for us. So you, I mean, Ventura college is where I cut my teeth and with, with Rich Hill at Cal Lutheran university, in the early nineties. Um, Rich has been very successful all over. He's been at the university of Hawaii. Now we were ranked number one in the nation there, Rich Hill and Marty Slimak. Um, and Slimak won the national championship down there. He's a great coach. I, I think he's in the hall of fame down there. He should be. Um, and, uh, so just learning how to recruit from others is, is something, again, you're learning from others. You, nobody, there's no book. You've got to learn. Mm -hmm. You just can't say, okay, I'm going to recruit and do it this way because you really don't know what's going to work. Right. I think where all that work came to a culmination would be when I moved up here to finish my career. So I, I came to Washington in 2015, 2016, and I was phasing out. I was done. I just came to retire. Um, it hasn't worked that way, <laughs> right? I mean, I took over Clark College and we built that program into a place where, where I'm happy where it's at now. And then... After the pandemic, I started building the rosters for Portland. Um, I helped George, uh, Justin Barkas do that, but he was the main guy, right, until he left. So I think it really came to a culmination. All the work and all the experience came to a work and came to a head at Clark College and for the Portland Pickles. Uh, recruiting for me is finding the best player possible that fits our system, character-wise, athletic-wise, uh, in school, academic-wise. And with the Portland Pickles, it's it's – does he fit the system, character guy, and ultimately does he compete? Because everything's about competing. So that's one of the questions I always ask is, does he compete? How, what was he like as a competitor? And then the other thing is building the program in a style and a manner that I think reflects what we want it to be in Portland, what I want it to be in the clubhouse, and and does it does it look like America? Mm -hmm. And does can it can it win? Right. Because I get paid in Portland to win. I mean, let's be honest about it. People go, hey, it's summer baseball. Not anymore. The West Coast League is really competitive. You got some you got some great programs. You got you got Corvallis Knights. Right. Go look at their history. Right. Go look at Brooke Knight. That guy can manage at any level, anywhere. And he's a great human being. 
Go look at Wenatchee. Go look at Bell, uh, Bellingham. I mean, the list goes on. Ridgefield, Dakota down there can really manage. And go look at go look at Callets. You got a big leaguer sitting in that dugout, right? So it's um, it's a it's a tough league, and and everybody it's it's about getting kids playing time, getting them better, getting them exposed. But ultimately, we want to win. The scoreboard's on, mm-hmm. right? If it wasn't important, they wouldn't turn the scoreboard on. If you turn the scoreboard on, it's for real. Whether it's a scrimmage, if the scoreboard's on, there, there's a winner and a loser, right? There's no, there's no, there's no trophy. There's no, there's no second place finish, right? You got, you got to try to be the best at what you do. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's all about competition, and yeah, they're keeping track. Might as well win. Absolutely. Absolutely, hundred <laughs> percent. That's why we don't play games in my house. My son, uh, Mark, and his, his wife, Jessica, and my wife, Joey, were playing games in there. And the next thing I know, things are flying around the house. So we've limited games. We no longer play games in the house. So um, No board know, games. No you board don't games. have Friday night board games. Absolutely zero board games. Okay. No board games. They, they, they It just doesn't go, go well. Yeah. Absolutely. All, all four of us just want to win. And I don't want to play something where like a 12-year-old can beat you. <laughs> <laughs> because you know he's just going to jump and run around. So no thanks. Get back here. We're playing again. Yeah, oh, Absolutely. <laughs> hundred percent until I win and then I'm leaving. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we'll call it good. So you guys win the championship for the first time. Oh yeah. That was fun. What was, what was that experience like th- this summer, you know, compared to the, the other years we can get into, you know, like you come up here in 2015, go through Clark college. When did you start with the pickles? But to that same year, Jim Hopple uh, got me hired with the pickles. I was a third base coach and uh, worked in the offense uh, for Portland. I was very happy doing that. I mean, I let Justin, uh, take all the heat and it was fun right? because I was coming off Clark and I enjoyed it and Justin left and then we sort of switched roles and Hop and I are still together but, you know and uh, so winning the championship in Portland because we've been here for nine years so this is year nine for us we saw it come from the great west league to the west coast league um, and for me personally and and Hop you know going coming in and getting the job but four years ago sort of midway through the season sort of right in that little niche not midway but close to midway and then losing that first year that on the last day of the season um on the road and that bus ride home uh, it hurt so then we went to work right away i can tell you this i was recruiting september 1st i took like a couple days off hit september 1st and we go 36 and 16 the next year and um richfield eliminates us uh and sweeps us uh and Losing that 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 loss, I think, um, especially at home, um, that one hurt. And and everybody goes, it's summer baseball, but not hurt because you put your time into recruiting the team. You're you've you've put something into something in long, hard hours putting a team together, and we just didn't we didn't get it done, right? So that's my fault because we didn't get it done. I you know, so you go back and you look at and you say, What did I do that I shouldn't have done and what can I do better? So go back to work a little bit earlier that the next year. And, and I think we're better. That was last year, year three. Um, I think we're better and we're, we're playing pretty well. And then we just got banged up. No excuses. We get banged up and we are struggling. We are just limping to the finish line. And you know, how baseball is right. Um, we have, a we, uh, we go to Ridgefield or Ridgefield comes to us or the top seed. We just barely squeak into the playoffs and we sweep Ridgefield and we shouldn't have, they were better, but we were just hot. Right. So we go play Corvallis in the in the South Conference game and and Corvallis beats us, I think five to two. Um, they played great. You know we we had guys. You know we just were limping, and but they were better than us, and they they were they were better than us on the field. Their manager was better than me. Their coaching staff was better than us. Um, they just beat they just beat us, and they deserved the championship. And I, 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 it was just a a good year. It wasn't a great year. So we went back to work even earlier. I mean, really did. Um, like I think we lost and I think I was on the phone two or three days later, starting to put a roster together. Um, because you get to the championship game and now you, you got to taste the cake, but no ice cream. Right. <laughs> so we work harder and we put together this roster and we, I thought we did a really good job of staggering arrival times and departure times. And I thought we were in really good shape. And, you know, obviously we're going to finish with 40 wins in the regular season and 44 overall. And then with about two to three weeks left, we lose Kevin Ferguson, who's from the University of Hawaii, uh, who was leading us in RBIs at the time. We lose Patrick Keegren, uh, who's a all-star, going to the University of San Francisco, WCL all-star. And we lose uh, the freshman player of the year from Cal Poly. 
uh, peanut garza um, to dislocated thumb, and they're all going to be gone. And now I'm going, oh my goodness. So we plug, we plug and play. We get really fortunate, and we make we get a call, uh, and we get a kid named Aaron Barber, and he's able to do the things we need him to do in the two hole. Like he can really handle the stick. He hits for average, and he's probably one of the best bad ball hitters we've ever seen. Um, and he can really play, can really play. And then we get a guy named Cody Kashimoto from St. Mary's, and he's switch hitting middle infielder, who's, and he comes in and he plugs that shortstop hole. Um, and I go, okay, these guys are not the same players, but they're really good players, but they do things a little bit differently. So we, we start playing our style of baseball, but a little bit more, right? And they play great for us down the stretch. They're red hot and um, we're just excited. They, they, they brought excitement to the clubhouse. I mean, instead of panic, we just said, okay, n- next guy up and we continued to go. So we get to, uh, we get to bend and they're really good and we beat them on the road and then we beat them at home. And then we get to go see uh, Corvallis Knights and it was just a good ball game. I mean, it was, it was at four to one, something like that. And, you know, they played, they played well, we played well. We just, that's just one of the days we beat them. I mean, we played them, but well, we played them seven times, seven times we played them. We were two and five against them. They, they controlled the entire series. In fact, I don't even think we beat them the year before they had our number. So we, we, we beat them on the very last series day. Game six, we beat them for the first time. Freddie Rodriguez beat them. And all of a sudden, hey, man, we made them bleed, right? Yeah. We can beat them, right? Super Bowl has – Superman has – because has, <laughs> they are – They're human. They're, they're, I'm not sure they're human. <laughs> they might have been human the day we beat them. They're, yeah. I mean, people, they're good. Mm-hmm. You know, they some some people call them the evil empire. I, I, I don't like that. They're, there's nothing evil about those people from their management – to their manager, their coaching staff, their players. They treat the game the right way. They're respectful. Um, they just compete really hard, and they're really good. Uh, so to beat them was good. So we now we know we can beat them, and, that, and I thought we played well in the championship game. So that was fun. And then you get Wenatchee, which I thought was going to be a trap game because you're coming off that high of defeating the seven-time champion, and you're coming into a game that you've got to be emotional for too because it's basically another game seven. You just, you just won a game seven against Corvallis, and now – in theory, you got to win another game seven. Um, I I, th- I thought we were a little flat, but I thought we we just grinded through it, grinded through it. And in the last inning, we did what we did, right? You know, we we win with two outs, walk off, and um, I, I I firmly believe the good Lord had a plan, and we just were we were on the right track, and we just followed it because we got we got everything we needed in the ninth inning. We just had to we just had to make it happen. Yeah. And now you guys are getting fitted for rings. Yeah, that's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty fun. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at them now. I mean, I, I saw the first draft, and, and I know they're doing some other things to it, but I know that our ownership is going to do the right thing, and they always do, and, and they're excited about it, and so are we. How would you describe the Portland Pickles playing style? Like you mentioned, we start playing our type of baseball. What is Portland Pickles baseball? Every team that I coach – and that I'm that that I'm that I get to create their 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 identity. Well, what how I want our teams to play like. And Nick Krupke is probably going to just go. Are you going to say this again? Nick's my friend. And, he, and, I, and the first time I used this line was with him. Uh, he was doing a special on us at Clara College, and I'm going to say it again. I said it just the other day uh, on Northwest AM AM Northwest. Every team that we play because we're in the north, or every team that I coach because we're in the Northwest. We don't want to be the Jaguar. We don't want to be the sports car. We want to be the 1975 F-150. Dual cap, dual tanks, four-wheel drive, a little chrome to keep us sexy. <laughs> uh, and we just want to grind. Um, and so so it's old school, and people go, describe old school. Old school means that we're going to fight for 90 feet. Mm-hmm. We're going to fight to control the first out of every inning defensively, and we're going to do our very best to win first base with no outs, get our lead, our LOM on every inning, leadoff man on every inning. That's the goal. Because if he gets on, we're going to score. We are going to put up a picket fence offense, right? A picket fence offense means we're going to try to score one run an inning. And I know the book says, hey, it's the first inning, man on first, don't bunt. Hey, man, we bunted mm-hmm. in, in the championship game. Uh, but I don't necessarily do that. So I have a standing rule. To let the world know if if it's the first inning and we get first and second, no outs, the way it works, my three-hole guy is going to bunt. 
because I want to be up one or two to nothing in the first inning and make the other team catch up. So the goal is to put up one, one, one. So it looks like a picket fence. Mm -hmm. Um, And what you'll see happen in California, they call it the Donnie Adams, call it the hybrid, but um, you'll see that it's somewhere around the fifth or seventh inning. We've got a pitchers, the starting pitchers pitch count is going to be up. We want it to be at about 90 pitches by the fourth or fifth inning. And if you look back, we, we really grind out at bats. We, so we want those that picket fence offense is going to turn into a crooked number somewhere between the fifth and the seventh. We'll, we'll get we'll get our we'll get our crooked number. So that's how we want to run the offense. Running that offense and creating that picket fence offense, you have to believe in one thing. You have to believe that you got to grind pitchers down, and know that if you get into their bullpen on the first game of a series, there's a good chance you're going to win the series. So we want their bullpen, and we want them heavy in their bullpen game one of a series. And then we, even if we lose the series, we feel like we've won the series. We won 18 series this, this year in the summer, 18. I would say somewhere between five and seven times we lost the first game of that series, but we were deep in their pitching count. We came back and won game two and game three to do that. You got to believe in your two strike plan. You can't just say it and tell them about it. You've got to practice it. So at, with Portland and same with Clark, we have, put on the machines, velo machines, and we work our plan in what we call early work. So we'll get we'll get our swings against velo, and then the last part of it is you have to take two-strike approaches using the plan that we have. So that means you got to trust your two-strike plan, and that means you got to have a goal. We want to have more walks and hit-by-pitches combined than strikeouts. And I, I know you're back there, so if you could look at our strikeouts for the Portland Pickles and then look at our walks and our hit by pitches and add those together. It's got to be in in my mind, it's going to be between 130 and 150, maybe 130 more walks and hit by pitches than strikeouts. More, more. Wow. We, we strike out less than we walk. Walks are base hits. Imagine this. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Imagine this. I tell my, I tell our, I tell our players all the time. Imagine a pitcher giving up five hits, right? But giving you six base on ball. That's 11 hits. That's 11 opportunities to score runs. And he maybe hits you once or twice. You didn't get four hits, five hits. You got 12 or 13 hits. So we want to win 90 feet. So to do that, you got to be the best two-strike hitter in the West Coast League. That's what we want to be as a team. If you strike out a lot, um, you're not going to play unless you put up astronomical power numbers. Uh, that's part of our style. So uh, part of being uh, that, that style we're talking about is pitching. We, we don't want to walk people. Right, our pitching staff this year with the Portland Pickles, I believe, was ranked number one. So we we got great pitching, and how we handle that pitching is 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 our unique way of handling it. Um, we have two starters for every game in our mind, uh, and those guys aren't allowed to go more than four innings or sixty five pitches, and they get six days of rest. And our and our relievers that come in, they, they throw depending on how many pitches or how many innings they go, they get between three and five days of rest. So now when a school gives us a player. We're not going to overuse them. We can list. We can um, limit the, limit the risk factor of getting somebody hurt, and we're not overusing anybody. So, hitting, pitching, right? And we're going to play defense, man. We're going to practice playing defense. We say it every day: follow your process defensively. It's going to win you games, and it's going to keep you in the lineup when you get to your next school. So, we're going to play defense. I think we finished third in defense in the WCL this year. We play on grass and dirt. I, the two teams in front of us, I believe, played on turf. So um, I think we're one of the better teams defensively. So we want to pitch, play defense, and win 90 feet. And we and we got to be really tough. And we got to do it the right way. Um, and the right way means my dugout, our dugout, whether it's at Portland or whether it's at Clark, we don't talk to other teams. We don't chip other teams. We're we're not we're not raw raw guys. I want our guys to get off the bench, shake hands, talk baseball. I mean, do what they do in the dugout and um, and just treat the game with respect. Um, I think it's important to understand that we represent the guys that came before us at, at all, at various levels. The guys that have put on a uniform, we represent them. It doesn't matter who they are. We want to do it the right way. We want to do it for the people that are sitting in our dugout now, right? And we want to do it for the guys that are coming after us. We want we want to leave a legacy on how to play the game the right way. In my mind, I, I believe it's the right way. I don't believe that you should be putting on shows in the dugout. I don't believe, I don't believe any of that stuff. I think just watch the game, have fun, joke around, do what you're doing, stay locked in and treat the game the right way. And and who cares what the opponents are doing? It doesn't matter to us.
Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's how, that's old school. I mean, it's, 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 it truly, you get three rules when you play for me, I have no rule book, three rules. They're simple. Be on time. Okay. Play hard, do the right thing. So let's look at the three rules that we have in our, in, in, whether you're at Clark or whether you're with Portland, no matter where I'm at, be on time, a sign of respect. In this day and age, if you're going to be late, and there's reasons you could be late, you know, traffic, accident, flat tire, whatever it is, right? Um, you lock your keys. I lose my keys all the time. You got the phone, communicate. Part of building a relationship. Be on time, sign of respect. Play hard. Not just on the field. In the classroom, be the best at what you want to be. Uh, when you have a real job, be the best at what you choose to be. It's your choice. You chose to be it, so be the best at it. So play hard, do the right thing. If you think it's stupid, if you think about it twice, if you go, I don't know, it's stupid. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. So be on time, play hard, do the right thing. And by having those three rules, it gives me flexibility on how I discipline because not everything warrants a, a code, right? Or, you know, if you have a law, you got to follow the law. So it gives me some flexibility and I think that's important. And then ultimately, for young coaches and all coaches that I learned this from, uh, from some veteran coaches, same rules for everybody, but everybody's different. Mm -hmm. Everybody's different. So create relationships with the players. Find out who they are. Find out about their families. Make sure you say hello every day. Say please and thank you. You want respect. I, I think coaches sometimes, especially young guys, think they deserve the respect because they got that proverbial whistle around their neck and that clipboard. Um, I believe coaches and people in power need to earn respect. And if you can earn respect by telling the truth and hurting people's feelings with the truth, never, never mincing words, just tell the truth. Um, you're going to get loyalty and respect given back to you tenfold uh, because that's relationship building. And don't be afraid to tell the truth. I think that uh, young coaches and, and people sometimes want to not tell the truth and they ended up telling untruths or partial truths. And that gets around the clubhouse in a hurry. And if you don't tell the truth, then people stop believing in you and people stop playing for you. So ultimately, how can you tell who's doing a really good job? How hard do your players play for you on a consistent basis? And that's that's the important thing to look at. But that's how we run, we run things in Portland in a nutshell. There's more to it, obviously, but that's how we do it wherever I'm wherever I'm going to be the boss or in charge. That's how we're going to do things. So much great stuff that you just covered there. You think? Oh yeah, that's amazing. Really I, good stuff. I just saw it on YouTube the other day, so I copied it. Yeah, you just <laughs> re, you, you have a pretty good memory. You just Does, repeated. Doesn't everything come off YouTube? Yeah, right. <laughs> Everything's for real on YouTube. Everything's the truth on that thing. I, I, Everyone's I, the expert. Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Uh, all of you know the three rules that you mentioned. That's the first time that I've heard of the picket fence analogy as far as an offense, like scoring every run. That makes sense. We never do that. Yeah. We never inning. It's frustrating because, you know, comparing what you describe to what is being seen on the major league field can be completely different at times. You know, everyone's chasing the power and doing certain things instead of taking the walks, um, getting the hit by pitches, all those things. And that's why I think it's really important, like for pitchers, the, their whip, walks plus hits divided by innings pitched. And then also with a batter, it's not just the batting average, but the on-base percentage, as you mentioned. Can they get on base? And then the slugging, can they do the damage? Um, it's all really good stuff. And well, I, I build my lineup sort of like that. So like, mm -hmm. you know, you go one through nine, right? So imagine this, my leadoff guy is a one backslash four. Now, let's play with me for a bit. Mm -hmm. My two guy is a two backslash five. My three is a backslash six. My four is a backslash one. So he's my second best leadoff guy. Hmm. Not necessarily my best, most prolific power guy. Okay. He's my second best leadoff guy. My five is my backslash two. He's my second best two-hole hitter. My six is my backslash three. He's my second best three-hole hitter. Mm -hmm. Seven, one, eight, two, nine, three. So if you look at our numbers, you'll see that it all falls into play. Mm -hmm. And a good offense has to get pro pro productivity out of seven, eight, nine. Because if they can get on base, on base percentages, OPS, guess what's behind them? Mm -hmm. A four slash one. I mean, a one slash four, a two slash five, a three slash six. So it just, we, and that's how we hit that day. We hit in lineups. So you're sort of in a group and you're figuring it out. And then 
what we do is we create something called the 44 club and I have to put it together for the pickles. I know, I know who's in it, but the 44 club means that you have to produce 44 runs to get into the club run scored RBI. Plus we add a special thing to it. It's called a baseball play. Let's say you're at first base, you get a dirt ball, read, get to second you're, and you score, you're going to get an extra half point for the dirt ball read. Let's say Armando Brasinio is hitting in the three hole and Kashimoto gets on first, which happened in the playoffs and Barber gets on. So we got first, second, no outs, first inning. Armando gets the sack done. Both runners move over. He gets a half point for every one of those runs that score because he got, he got the sack bunt down. So everybody wants to get in the 44 club. So what it does is it creates competition in the dugout. Everybody wants to get in the 44 club and everybody wants to lead the 44 club, right? Mm -hmm. So now that dirt ball read, that sack bunt, people are going, oh yeah, they start pumping each other up. And in our dugout, I, I always start at the beginning of summer. I'll say, Armando, those are your runs. And when they come in, I'll look at them and point at them. And then pretty soon guys will start going, hey, those are yours. Those are yours. Oh, sacrifice is huge. Now, in this day and age, sacrificing anything is not cool, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because people want, they're out for themselves, right? They want to be the, the yeah, guy. Yeah, absolutely. So now we got guys going, hey, man, I'm willing to sacrifice for my brothers, right? For the team, for us. And so you want to get into the 44 club. Uh, so that's how you create that, want to play that type of baseball. It's just one of the ways we do it, the 44 club. Yeah, that's really good. So, it sounds like that could be pretty hard to track if there's a lot going on in the game. Every day, you just go look at, you just go through the Is there someone in the dugout with the check marks? Mark Magdaleno. Next okay. day, box scores. I have game notes. Okay. So, and back to 44 Club is something that Coach Don Adams, one of my mentors, that was his baby, and I, I brought it with me. So, I'm going to give him credit for it. But we added on the baseball play stuff. But he's, he's, a, he was a, he's a genius. Um, so... Yeah, I'll look at it the next day and I'll start tallying them. So I keep a running tab of things as they're going. And then every every once in a while, they'll get updates on it. So they get, and they'll get sweatshirts. So we're working on all 44. We'll, they'll have the pickles sitting on 44 someplace. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. I still owe some guys out there from 2017, <laughs> 2018. So I, I know you're going to text me. I, I'll, you'll get one. So, but um, yeah, that's an important part of it. And we just want people to buy into that system. And I think that, you know, you're starting, I, I watch major league baseball when I can, because I'm pretty busy, but I, you're starting to see some of the, some of the things come back for the pendulum starting to switch, right? You know, you want to talk about launch angle and this, and it works in, in theory, it works because pitchers were taught to pitch on a downward plane. Right. Uh, but pitchers aren't dumb. You can run a fastball up, especially with spin rate. And it's pretty tough to hit that with a launch angle. That's why strikeouts are up. Uh, strikeouts are boring. Right. You know, watch the watch, watch them play. The teams that are coming back can do a lot of little things going first to third on singles. Right. Not just going first to second and just stopping. there waiting for the big fly. The, the teams that are winning, I think, are playing the game the right way. Um, and um, I hope it comes back because somewhere in the middle is going to be the perfect place for baseball. Not that I'm an expert. Um, I don't think analytics is the way to go. Um, I it, Analytics should be should be used, but they should be used as a jumping off point, a reference because ultimately your eyes and your ears got to tell you a story, mm -hmm. right? That's why Dusty Baker and all those old guys, uh, not old guys, but all the old school guys, they're, they're geniuses, right? Cause they, they trust their eyes, they trust their ears. Um, and they, and every once in a while they got a hunch, right? But they're, those hunches are based off the, the, the reference of the analytics. If a guy's three for three on the day at the plate, you're not going to pinch hit for him late in a game against a same handed pitcher, just because the analytics tell you that, the pitcher might do better against that type of guy and the hitter might not have the best history because like today he's hot, he's feeling good. You want to keep him in there and give him the opportunity. I, I'm, I'm not pinch hitting for him. Right. Um, other guys might. Um, and I think a couple of things I wouldn't pinch hit for him because I wouldn't want to go home and listen to my wife and, <laughs> and have to answer her questions. Uh, that would be the first <laughs> foremost cause that it would just be, it's bad. So, um, I wouldn't do it because the guy's seeing the ball well, right? And um, analytics aren't the answer. I mean, I'm sure the guys that are going to disagree are the analytics guys. Uh, they probably got C's in gym class. You know, um, they didn't play. Uh, so I'm going to trust the guys that played. Mm -hmm. I'm going to trust their eyes. I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust what they what they see. 
Uh, and um, didn't didn't the New York Yankees just go back to having all baseball guys in their dugout or something like that? I can't remember the story. Sure. But I have to look it up. I read just pieces of it, but like no I, analytics guys are allowed in the dugout. I, I don't know. I have to look at it, but I yeah. love watching Boone manage. I know he gets criticized, but I think he's a baseball mind. I think I, and I trust him to, to run the Yankees. I'm not a Yankees guy, but I like watching him work. Right? For certain managers, you just like watching work. Um, I just believe baseball is is played played on the field and and analytics have a role but they're not the, they're not the all they're not all everything. Yeah. And that's just me. And I and I'm not a big leaguer. Right? I'm just I'm basically I get to watch big leaguers and be a fan. I'm just a guy who who's never really had a real job. I've always been a baseball guy. I mean, I've, I've had a couple of real jobs and they suck. <laughs> and it sucks going to work. It's much better being on a diamond. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So there's the analytics part, like like I described late in the games, those type of analytics. And then there's when you're talking about getting on base, how do you describe to hitters and to pitchers, you know, like the dominating the zone, like the Mariners have, right? To where you show the analytics of if you win the 00 count, you get to 01 as a pitcher, you get to 10 as a hitter. The the analytics behind the future moving forward, that the the rest of that at bat is going to be heavily in your favor if you just win that 00. If you win the, the one one, do, do you know in 1978 they didn't call it analytics, but we knew those things. Yeah, we did. We did. In the in the 80s, we knew that. The 90s, before analytics were there, we knew that you're. We used to say, if you throw strike one, you're gonna your your batting average is gonna drop this amount of points. Mm -hmm. We didn't have analytics. It was just old time guys telling us that, right? Um, so I believe analytics are, like I said, a, a good reference. I don't think you can live and die by them. I mean, it, are there certain teams in the big leagues that live and die by them? Yes, and I think they're underachievers. I mean, because they have some really good players, but they're living and dying with them. And they and so, um, but I don't knock people because I'm not in the big leagues. That's just my thought. I'm just saying I, I it doesn't make sense to me. And I still think that you've got you've got those guys sitting in the dugout. You got guys, bench coaches. You got players all over that are doing it. That have lived it. Have gone through the grind of the minor leagues. Have gone through the big leagues. They know more than the analytics department. Mm -hmm. um, and but I think by using the analytics department can only make them better. But it can't be the whole package. It just has that to be a support. Sense. And that's just my thought. Right. But everybody and everybody should everybody should have their own their own thoughts and right? their their own voice. But that's what I think. It doesn't make me right, but that's what I think. Can you describe what it means to have a two strike approach? Yeah, you ever played wiffle ball in your backyard? Oh yeah. Okay, and your buddy's got you o two, and he's gonna he's gonna throw you whatever he's gonna throw you right, and you're going. There's no way in hell this guy's striking me out right because he's not gonna start pumping his fist and yelling at me. <laughs> a, sixty feet six inches. Right, the greatest one on one confrontation in all of sport. Tennis, uh, great sport. Got a round ball with a racket and nobody can talk. Okay, <laughs> all right. You got this guy 60 feet, six inches away from you who's going to get a ball. You're going to say he's running the ball up 92 to 95. Blink your eye, just blink him. That's how long you have to determine whether it's a fastball, a four seamer, two seamer a cutter, a slider, a change, a breaking pitch, splitty, whatever it is, right? That's how long you have to determine whether it's up or down, in or out, ball or strike. The good Lord gave you the greatest computer on the planet. It sits three feet up from your butt. It's called your brain. So we have to be trained to do that. So that's how tough this is. 60 feet, six inches away. And he's not going to tell you what's coming, right? And he might hit you with the pitch. And, and as, much, as much as you say, hey, take it, it hurts. So now he's got you two strikes. It's a wiffle ball game. Our plan is simple. The umpire never determines the outcome. Okay. And we never take a fastball for strike three. So we're going to look out to in, out to in. We're going to cover the outside and we're going to react to the pitch inside. We're going to look hard to soft. We're looking fastball. We are hunting a fastball. If he throws anything else and we get fooled, but our hands remain back, we still have the ability to foul the ball off, flip it into the stands, or still hit the ball hard someplace with our hands. Um, so ultimately, following the plan and creating a street fight, 
It's a wiffle ball game. Mm -hmm. It's a, the greatest competition on the planet. You were going to win that one-on-one -on -one confrontation because walking back to the dugout in the collegiate game, I believe, and in any game should be humbling. You should be humbled that the guy beat you. Tip your hat to him if he beat you and figure out how he got you out because he's going to try to do it the same way the next time. Mm -hmm. They're going to keep going back to the well until you learn to adjust. So our two-strike plan is about just being competitive. Everything is compete. And it's out to in, hard to soft. And don't lose. I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times you, it, at our level you go 0-2 and you draw a walk. That's a win. 0-2 to walk, 2-2 two, two to walk, two-strike to walk, win. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you hit the ball hard, but it's an out. Quality at bat. You were able to get to the two-strike and you hit it hard. Uh, you take strike three looking. That's a fastball. Hey, man, you'll, you'll walk back to the dugout. I won't say anything to you, but I made one more. Were you guessing? And, the, and yes, what's the plan? Stick to the process. Stick to the process and compete. Um, it's simple as that. We also, at our level, we, we limit the stride. So if you're a leg kick guy, we take away the leg kick. And just add, we want less body parts moving so that you can be on time because hitting is dancing with the pitcher, making sure our front foot's on time. So we want to make sure you're down on time. So we'll take that away. Mm -hmm. um, and so we limit the, the, the movement of our body. Okay. And, and then we just compete. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple. Difficult. Simple in your mind, right? Mm -hmm. But difficult at any level. And you could do all the preparation and the planning ahead of time. But then as soon as you step in the box, you know, it's totally different. It's yeah. like just you have to react. Absolutely, hundred percent. And you know, you practice it. We practice it with velo machines, right? And and it could be a it could be a fastball that day on the outside half. It could be, it could be a, a right handed slider. And with machines, sometimes they're strikes, sometimes they're balls. So when you go into it, we say, hey, you you inherited a two two count. Your job is to win it. And the coach will sit behind the cage. Go, that's a ball three two. Here you go, boom, ball four. You win. Get out of the cage. Next guy, mm -hmm. right? So we just treat it like an at bat. We go through a couple of routines like that and. They start to buy in, and and uh, it's it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch. It's fun to watch a two strike knock. Nothing is more demoralizing than that. Right. And you mentioned, you know, getting to the opposing pitchers, uh, the opposing team's bullpens. What, what do you think about how? What are your thoughts on an OO, you know, swing? I'm different. Um, so when you come to Portland and you play for me, and and uh, let's say it's a third inning, fourth inning, and you know we got this guy on the ropes. You know, he's at 57 pitches, you know, heading into the third or something. And the leadoff guy goes up and swings. Whack. And he could line out, okay, or fly out or ground out. What, no matter what, if it's an out, it's a one pitch out. Mm -hmm. It's a one pitch out. So what does the guy following him have to do? Probably has to take a pitch. Otherwise, there's a chance it's going to be a two pitch inning. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So throw a fastball down the middle for strike one. Uh-oh, now it's... Batting average because the analytics tell us <laughs> that it's going to drop, yeah, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I want my leadoff guy to ground out, grind out at bats every every inning. So, my LOM will want you to grind out at bats. If that LOM guy that that just let off that inning two innings later comes up with runners on runners on base in scoring position, let the big dog eat. Right. Let's go. Let's let's be aggressive. There's time to be aggressive. There's times to be smart. Um, it's a physical chess match, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't it playing chess? Oh yeah. I mean, so yeah, there's more to it than just going up in that day in the data saying, Oh, Oh, this is a good pitch to hit. What part of the game is it? What's the score? Where's the pitcher at in his pitch count? You know, there's a lot of things that, that you have to be to be a baseball player and people forget you got to be smart. You got to be smart. Yeah. Each guy, no matter you know, who's on base, how many outs there are. You have a different approach every time you go up to the plate because there's different situations constantly throughout the game. Uh, you, you, you could have a runner on second base, no outs, and, you know, you're trying to hit the ball right center field, right? Not to right field. You're trying to hit the ball behind him. Um, and the first pitch could be an inside fastball. Of course you're going to run a two-seamer in because they know you're trying to go that way. Take it for strike one. Trust your two-strike approach. Do your job, right? It, because you you got to do a job. Situational hitting is still part of baseball. Uh, and, and hitting behind a runner isn't just hitting the ball to the right side. Like you, you hear people say, knock the second baseman over with this. Well, then you're being fine. That's when you start flurrying balls in the right field stands. That, that runner at second base has a primary and a secondary. 
Every ball to his left of his hip, as an example, is behind him, right? So he should be advancing on that. So if you just think, hit the ball up the middle, that's behind the runner. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're on time, you can hit the ball up the middle. You're gonna you're gonna advance him. We want I want doubles. <laughs> I don't want just a ground ball to second baseman, right? You want a base hit. If you're a little bit later, the pitch is away. This is just common sense. I don't know if there's any science behind it. You're going to hit it to the right side. You have from his left hip all the way to the foul line in right field you're mm -hmm. playing with, not just right field. So you give yourself a better opportunity to get a knock. A knock is better than a ground ball to second base. Mm -hmm. right? So situational hitting is also part of the deal. We practice situational hitting all the time. So how many games throughout the summer are there? How many days a week? And then how many days do you have practices where you're working on all this stuff? Or is it all pregame? I, I, well, if we're at home, um, our players will tell you, we, we start early work sometime, be, you know, we'll start saying the fill up at two 30 and we'll, we'll start getting going around three o'clock and we'll work on whatever we need to work. If we, uh, we were in Springfield, right. And, uh, we lost a game one and we didn't handle their bunt game. Well, and we're the team that does it. They did it to us. So I was not happy. So the next day we came out and before we took batting practice, we went through all our bunt coverages. We made, we simplified them. We practiced them. We didn't care if they were watching us practice them. And then we went to our pregame batting practice. At home, we have early work um, as far as hitting, two-strike approach. Uh, pitchers get done whatever they need to do, get done with BG. And then we'll go into our batting practice. So we could be starting at like, say, 3, stretching, 3.15, early work, get a little bit of a break. 4.15, we'll get ready for BP. And we'll take BP from 4.15 to 5. And five to six is our break, and then we're going going to play. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a there was a string of days that we might have played, including exhibition. I think about twenty five in a row. Wow! Okay. In fact, I believe we had eighteen consecutive road games. So whoever made that schedule, and I'm I'm sure I'm right on that. I don't know what they were thinking. So um, that was a long haul. So we don't get very many breaks, um, and it's supposed to resemble life in the minor leagues, mm -hmm. the grind. And it, it does. Um, and um, it's fun to do. It's fun to go to work every day. I mean, it's, they, and they love it. The play, baseball players innately want to work, right? They innately want to work. And uh, they, they love it. You want to learn something. You want to get better every day. Just one new, new thing. If you can just feel a pitch a little differently, that makes it break the way that you want it to. Right. And, and we've, been, we've been blessed with, with really good people in Portland. And, and I've been blessed with good people at Clark. So, uh, but Portland was just, fantastic the last nine years everybody comes in we have fun doing it though i mean everybody's got nicknames and we joke with each other we play practical jokes on each other it's it's fun as heck it's a, it's a great time you're welcome to come on a trip with us anytime you want i'm in anytime you want next season i'm you're, doing you're, it you're 100 come on in okay I I, 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 you come hang with us you can be with us on the you can be with I can i do it can i do a vlog yes <laughs> okay. absolutely you know we had we had first of all i think it would be fun for you is to come to a homestand and then after we finish a homestand, jump on that charter and head to wherever we're going, Kelowna, or wherever we're going on the road, and just and just see how it is and do your blog from there. Yeah, do, do, find a place to run your blog, man. You 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 would dig it. We uh, actually had we were I think they're running a documentary on us. I can't remember who it's for. I talked with them. Yeah. Yep. Jordan. Jordan. Yep. Yeah. So we we had we were around him and Ralphie around and mic'd up and. I'm sure he's got a lot of editing to do because I have a lot of famous cuss words and that thing. So I, I'm hoping he's cutting them out, man. I'm, I don't want to hear about it from my mom later on. Yeah, like right. Stairs, so. though. Yeah. I, I actually jumped on a call with him this last week to to hear more about the documentary and, and all that. What was your experience with that throughout the season? And did you notice the cameras there when they were there? Or did you just go about it as as is? Sort of went at it as is because he's so, he's so super cool and he's a baseball guy. Um and it was fun because Ralphie was there and, and I, and I'm just, I'm hard on Ralphie because I like him so much. I think that's one thing is I think, I think that when I like somebody, I'm always a little bit tougher on you. Um, but it was fun. I mean, for the players, uh, being mic'd up was weird, right? Cause I, at first I thought, oh man, I can't say this. No, I can't say this. And then before, but then you forget, right? You're just being yourself and, and, sh and st <laughs> see, you, you see that it almost came out. Shit just happens. It, shit just, it almost <laughs> came out. And, and so you just got to watch yourself. Um, but, uh, it was, it was fun. I can't wait to see how it comes out, especially because it was a, it was the perfect ending. It was a fairy tale ending. Yeah. Ralphie's being lifted up by all the yeah, players. Yeah, that absolutely. Image. yeah. That, that was, uh, that was fun. I just, uh, the whole thing, I mean, it was, uh, the player, the fans rushing, the field. It was crazy. I'd never seen anything like it. And uh, Jordan Barkas, our third base coach, looked at me and goes, you got to stop this. I go, how the hell am I going to stop this? <laughs> I mean, there's even 700 people out there, maybe more. 
Um, you know, so getting to run over and see my family, Jody, Marky, and Jessica, part of my family, uh, that was fun, and and uh, it was cool. It was a good, it was a good time. Portland Pickles ba- baseball, it's a party. Oh, I mean, I've only been to a couple other West Coast League experiences, but it's a party in Portland. Like that's it's it's a good time there. <laughs> and you know, it's um, they're the great fans. They're the best fans ever. They're the loudest. They're so supportive. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely, it's definitely a tough place to play in, uh, for the opponents. Uh, and it's a place that the new pickles every summer have to learn to play in because they've never experienced anything like it either. Uh, and that championship game was over the top. I mean, it was, there was a lot of people in that place and it was loud. Like you couldn't hear yourself think, I don't know if you saw some of the stuff that's come out lately. I think it might've been from Jordan. There was a, mm-hmm. like a documentary type thing and you can just see us in the dugout. They're on our faces. And so it's just the ninth inning. And then you see the crowd come on it and it, and it was loud on the video. Yeah. I mean, how you guys won it at the end was wild. I mean, that is a testament to how you describe the offense and how you guys play baseball, the small ball, getting the walk. Yeah. It's, it, 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 life's a street fight, right? So I think when you look at that scoreboard, as I said, you'll see they scored two, we scored three. Then it was one, 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 one. Then they scored their one in the ninth on two oh two hits, by the way. Um, and uh when they scored their one, we scored two. And that inning, the way it played out was nuts, you know. So we Barber, who doesn't strike out, punches out, and uh then we get the uh we get the uh the ball hit by Bersinio down the line. Kudos to Wenatchee and Mitch. Uh they were in no doubles. If they weren't in no doubles, that would have been a double. So they hold them to first. Then we get the fielder's choice and we're first base down two with one out. And um, AG, Alex Guevara gets the, the knock to right. And now we're in business, right? And now comes the part of the picket fence. Um, and again, I say this all the time. I've said it throughout the year in pregame shows. Players win games. Managers lose games. And my job is to put them in a position to win. So our best base dealer probably one of the top three or four in the West Coast League, Tanner Griffith, all-star from St. Mary's. He's a second base. And honest to God, I'm not looking at the hitter. My eyes are focused on the second baseman in short middle of the infield. I'm just looking at the middle and the pitcher. And the first time he goes to the plate, he looks once at second and goes to the plate. I go, oh, shit. And Coach Barkas at third base normally says green light or red light because our players all have green lights. We never took off the green light. And it's not the first time this summer that we've left the green light out with two outs. I know it's not a baseball play, but I trust our guys. They have green lights. The second time, which is going to make it ball two, the pitcher, Vassar, looks once, goes to the dish. I went, oh, okay. He's going to go. Mm-hmm. In my mind, I knew he was going. Um, and the third time, He takes off. It's strike one. He's safe. It's not even close. Mm -hmm. And immediately my mind goes, okay, now he's got a decision. Mitch has a decision. It's 2-1 to Riley McCarthy from University of Portland, who's a really good hitter. It's lefty on righty. Here comes your analytics. Mm -hmm. Okay, here comes your analytics. And I thought, he's going to walk him because I have a lefty on deck, Diego Castellanos from St. Mary's, um, who's been playing pretty well. And I wasn't going to switch hit or pinch hit. I had pinch hitters on the bench. I'm not pinch hitting. Again, not analytics. This is why. Vassar, as ball four will show, fastball was missing arm side run. His breaking ball was working middle away to all left-handers. Castellanos, arm side run, crowds the plate and dives into the plate a little bit. He had a chance of getting hit. Two, Castellanos, hits lefties as well as he hits righties, and he's really good at taking the pitch middle away and driving it less center field gap. That's one of his fortes. So I like the matchup. On top of that matchup, Castellanos' on-base percentage was (laughs) had to be close to 450. It was over 400. So I knew he wasn't going to give away an Mm at-bat. I had complete confidence in Diego. So he goes, ball one, ball two. He spits on a breaking pitch, spits on a fastball, and then strike one, fastball. Credit to Vassar. He's going to pitch backwards because his money ball is his breaking pitch. Throws a breaking pitch. Diego spits on it. Three and one. Fastball's coming, right? Now you can be a really good hitter, right? Arm side run. It's a ball. It's ball four. He takes it. We're tied up. So again, analytics, 
no lefty on righty and me saying, forget analytics. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go keep my lefty on lefty because I like the matchup. If I believed in the analytics, I'd have pinch hit for him. I'm not doing it. Right. Let him go. He wins the game. He, he ties the game because he's good at what he does. Players win, mm-hmm. right? Tanner Griffith, players win. Diego Castellanos, players win. Then we get a break, right? Uh, Connor Stewart comes up, Long Beach State, and he gets first pitch breaking ball. And again, it's on now it's going to the inside part of the plate, and it's a good one. And he sort of doesn't roll over, but he doesn't hit it very hard. He hits it any harder or any slower, the third baseman's going to pick it and throw him out of first base. He hits it any harder, the shortstop's going to make the play and throw him out of first base. He hits it into the perfect 5-6 spot. The third baseman, play, playing hard as he can, God bless him, because he did his very best, dives because he knows he's got to get to this mm-hmm. ball. And when he does, he sort of blocks the shortstop off. And that ball is a base hit because it did take a tricky hop on him. But he didn't get to see it because the guy was diving in front of him. So uh, we, Willie Keeler, I mean, hit him where he ain't from the early 1900s, dead ball area. Look him up. So he hit him where he ain't. And, um, you know, we win the game. And the next thing you know, we're getting fitted for rings. But that inning, <laughs> that inning had more to it than just that. Like, so if you're a baseball fan and you want to dissect something, dissect runners on first and second, two outs, and just dissect the rest of the game right there. Because there was a lot of moves being made in that maybe four minute span Mm -hmm. in four minutes. There's a lot of mental moves being made by Mitch, by me, by a runner, by, by Tanner Griffith, by Diego Castellanos, by everybody. There's a lot of stuff going on. So when people say that baseball is boring, it's sort of like church, right? Easter Sunday, a lot of people go, uh, Christmas Eve, a lot of people go to church, right? But few understand they just go. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was a lot going on at that time. Yeah, once you actually know baseball and understand it, like we've said before, it's chess. Chess. What, what, what's that guy going to do? What, what, how am I going to react? Or, you know, all those decisions that are being made that have a, a reactionary or a chain effect on what happens the rest of the game. Hey, things that happen in the second or third inning can, can determine the outcome of, of a game. Yeah. Walk me through the recruiting process. What's it like to call someone you know, the day after a season ends, like, Hey, do you want to come play for the funnest team in the West coast league? It's, it's, uh, every year, every year, um, it gets, it gets more competitive, um, because everybody's, everybody's getting so much better and playing for the Portland pickles though, I think is, uh, <laughs> it's an honor, man. I, I, you put on that uniform. There's something to be said about putting on that uniform. Uh, we take great pride in how we, how we wear it, what we do when we're in it. Um, and you know, you can, you can say we're playing in in the funnest place ever, but once we get on in that dugout in our clubhouse, that's our surroundings, you know, that's what, that's, that's our, that's our work environment, but our, but our office is completely different. It is, is about baseball. And I think anybody that plays against our clubs and knows us will tell you, Hey, that's, that's not who they are. Right. We, 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 we love it, but we also know we have a job to do. So coming here, you've got to be a special guy in my mind, right? You got to be wanting to work. You want to get better. I believe our job at the Portland Pickles isn't only winning, but our job is to send a player back to their school that's going to help them win their conference, earn a regional, and ultimately win a national championship. I mean, how cool would it be to see a Portland Pickle win a national championship? It'd be just as cool watching them win a national championship as it is when we see Manzardo or, or our guys in the big leagues because it's just another great feat for guys uh, in their careers, right? And not all the guys that play in Portland are going to be big leaguers. Not all the players that play in Portland or in the West Coast League are going to be minor leaguers. They just may be great college baseball players, and that makes them extremely special. I mean, those guys that get to play college baseball are special athletes. Mm. So we want them to be the very best they can possibly be at their schools when we send them back. So playing for Portland um, or playing for Corvallis or Wenatchee or or Ridgefield or Cowlitz, all the great organizations in the West Coast League, Walla Walla, all of them, Yakima, they're all good. Mm -hmm. Victoria, they're all good. And they're all trying to do the same thing. That's why the league is so special. Yeah, and you really don't know the the talent that comes through this league until five years down the road when Mitch Hanniger, all these other guys, Travis Bazana, uh, you know, comes through. So that's why I'm trying to help spread the word of like, hey, if you're, if you're in Richfield, there's a really cool 
game happening right down the road that you got to go check out. It's great competition. Same thing with Portland. Um, how, how do you have to compete or what's it like to compete with the Cape, the Cape league? Uh, I, you, or is there any, I don't you know, think I, I, they're the Cape, right? Right. They're the Cape. Um, I don't, I don't know that I try to compete with the Cape. I, I want to say that uh, we want, we want the same type of players the Cape has. I try to get the same players the Cape has, and we don't always get them nor in very rarely do we get them. Uh, great league, obviously long tradition, mm -hmm. everything that goes with the Cape is for real. Uh, but all we worry about is our, our shield, the West coast league. And, you know, our, our owners in our league, our players in our league, our general managers, we all understand what we have to do here. We're trying to create a, a product that is universally thought of as one of the top summer leagues in America. And I think we're, we're heading in that direction. I believe in uh, the people that run our league. I believe in our organization. And I believe in other organizations. I think we're all in the same boat and we're all paddling in the same direction. Uh, and we're just trying to win championships against each other, but we're all pulling in the same direction. It's a great place to be. It's a great place to be part of. And that, I'm not saying that sincerely. You can walk into other stadiums and watch how you're treated and you're just treated with so much respect in other stadiums. Um, you, you can't put into words how it feels to take young people into areas and know that they respect you and they're going to treat you the right way. It's, it's a, it's a good, it's a good environment and it's a fun place to be. And I've asked players about what it's like to come and play in the West Coast League. And it's it's awesome to hear, you know, guys that are from Texas or from other parts of the country that come to the West Coast in the Pacific Northwest, specifically for the first time. They're traveling to Ridgefield, to Cowlitz, up to Canada, all the way down to Bend, just to see how beautiful it is up here and take it all in this, ex this experience. It's opening people's eyes. And um, yeah, I, I think it's awesome. It's really cool. It's It's a cool place. I mean, and... And how we do things in the league is fun. I mean, there's always a promotion, and the players the players love it. And and the, and the countryside's beautiful. Those bus rides are long, but you get to see some pretty cool things. Do you want to walk me through some of those players that we were talking about before we we jumped on well, here? Well, let's see. You got uh, this year. We had um, Carter Fredrickson drafted by the Kansas City Royals. He, he was out of University of Oklahoma. First went to Auburn, then had to, then went to a junior college and then to go into Oklahoma and we only got him cause he was scheduled to go to the Cape, but he broke his thumb. So Cape Cod guy, he big physical, outstanding human being, um, six foot five, six foot six runs a six, five, six, six, 60. Um, the first ball he hit was 111 miles an hour exit velo. I can still remember the shortest top arm going backwards. <laughs> and that's, uh, he's just tremendous player. And then Shay Timmer out of, um, Salt Lake city community college, he played for Jeremy Berg, was his pitching coach, and, and Jeremy pitched on Adventure College. So I, he was one of my a former player. And he sent a Shea Temmer, 6'10", 265, um, triple digits with his fastball. And a great athlete, another fantastic human being. He's now with Detroit Tigers. So two guys this year alone. Um, and then there was two more the year before um, and one the year before that. So in my first four years of managing here, we've had, what, two, four, five, or six guys drafted, uh, some guys from small schools, some guys from big schools, but, um, we're picking the right guys. Right. And, uh, I think our roster too, is I'm, I'm proud of it. it's a, it's a diverse roster, you know, um, in college baseball, uh, Latino participation is roughly about 6%. African-American participation is roughly around 5%. I could be off a couple of numbers there, but it's not very big. Um, so our, our diversity, our diversity is, is huge to me. I'm, I'm proud of what we do that in that, in that way as well. Um, so yeah, in fact, the championship game, you know, 80% of the starters were Americans of color or different ethnic groups. So a pretty cool thing. So those percentages that you mentioned, that's Pacific Northwest. That's nationwide. That's nationwide. Yeah. I, really. I'll show you the stuff. I've, I've, I've got stuff on it. 2022, 2023 Latino participation was 6%. In the um, country. Country. Wow. It's, it's a suburban sport. I mean, it's a the travel ball is expensive. You know, we price people out. Um, so yeah, I think, um, it's something that we should look at, but it's also, you just got to find players you can play. It doesn't matter where they're from or who, what they look like There's players that can play in that, that are people of character and play the game the right way and, and treat others the right way. And so, but on championship night, um, I think, I don't think I know 
eight, eight of our 10 starters, including the DH and your manager, were Americans of different uh, ethnic groups. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool what, what you're doing. Yeah, so I'm, I'm proud of it, um, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. What are the future plans for Coach Mags? You know, how much longer do you see yourself? I'm 43 into my going into my 43rd season. 65 going to be 65. Um, I don't see myself golfing because I'm not going <laughs> to, I don't like to hit things and then I have to chase it. Um, that, that way you'll be pissed off for four hours. Yeah, I, I would just be angry. Yeah. I, I've tried it. It's just not for me. My son loves it. I'm, I I'll, I'll drive the cart and drink the beers. I don't know. Um, it's coming. I, I know it's coming. Um, my mind's still fresh. So, um, it's coming. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to maybe player development someplace, you know, whether it's in a minor league system, um, an instructional league, or maybe just catching on with a young coach someplace that wants an old guy hanging around. Uh, I know that I can't give up the game. It's a love affair. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it truly is a love affair. I, I, I don't think that besides my family, I've loved anything like this. Uh, I love getting up in the morning. I love putting on the uniform. Um, even when you're tired, you just, you get to do it. I still, I still, I still dig it, man. I still dig it. I, but I know it's coming. Um, I was, I don't know what I'm going to do. I really don't. I mean, that's nobody's ever really asked me that. I don't know that I'll ever stop doing what I do. Um, it's just too much fun. It's too much fun. And I don't know what life would be without getting up in the morning and trying to be, be good at something. I mean, what are you going to be good at? I'm mowing the lawn. I don't know. Thanks. <laughs> You know, I don't like mowing lawns. Um, I don't know. I don't know, but it's coming. I mean, but not now. I, somebody asked, well, why don't you retire after you just won it all, right? And yeah, sounds like a great idea, except for I think all of us in this room right now have at some point or another, either in elementary school, played tetherball or, or four square, and nobody leaves until you get beat, right? Or you're playing basketball in the park. You don't leave the court till somebody beats you. Or if you're playing wiffle ball, you know, you got to play the next guy up, but you, the winner plays, right? Mm -hmm. The winner plays. Yep. So um, I don't think I could leave now because I would feel like I'm running away from a challenge um, and that we're running away from a challenge. A challenge is defending it. And that's probably harder than winning it. And I, I haven't talked to Brooke about it because he's got to defend it seven times, but I'm sure, you know, that, that it was, you know, knowing everybody's hunting for you, right? We're, we're going to be hunted next year. And uh, that's going to be the fun part of it, I think, is getting up and it's a new challenge. So I don't, I don't, retirement's coming. Um, honestly, and I'll say this publicly, probably my retirement will come first at Clark. And then after that, um, I'm happy with what we've done at Clark. I'm happy with what we've done at Portland. I just know that um, I owe my wife and my family uh, more time. I've missed uh, graduations. I've missed weddings. Uh, I've missed funerals. Um, because I've got a job to do, you know, um, I just, uh, I won't, I won't go to graduations, um, my own kids graduations because I've got a game, I'm um, getting paid to go to work. Uh, I know it sounds, <laughs> I always tease them. I go, you know, w w w way to go. You way to do what you're <laughs> supposed to, you're supposed to graduate. Nice job. Way to go. Um, yeah, I feel bad about a lot of the things that I've missed. And, uh, but again, I, are the regrets? Yes. And no, I mean, I'm, I'm it's baseball, you know, and, and, and you think you grip the baseball, pick up a baseball, you're gripping it. Right. And you're not gripping it. It's gripping you. If you really love it, man, it, you're not gripping it. It's got a hold on you, man. It's got, a, it tugs on your heart. It tugs on your mind. Um, yeah, it's, I don't know. I can't tell you. It's, it sort of sounds corny, but yeah, I don't know. I only asked that because you came up here to retire yeah, I and did. then you ended up getting right back into it. Yeah. I mean, and doing it at a really, really high levels and doing it a lot, doing it a lot. You know, um, I think we started Clark last year, like July, uh, G January 10th ish. And, um, we made a playoff run there. And I think I had like five or six days before I got back into a Portland uniform. So I, I think from, from that date until August 16th, maybe, maybe 15 days off. I probably put this, these are real clothes mm -hmm. except for this. Cause I wore this today. I, I probably put on real clothes on average of maybe 30 to 35 days a year. <laughs> my, my big, my big thought process every morning is when I'm at Clark, I get up and I go, all right, is it going to be Royal 
silver or black today. And that's what I put on. And then when it's Portland, I why why change into clothes when you know you're gonna be working in the lineups, looking at film and heading to the stadium about 1.30. So I just get up and put on whatever shorts we're going to wear for pregame that day yeah. and whatever shirt I'm going to wear, and then I'm done for the day. So, um, yeah, it's I, – I don't, I don't know what I'd do without baseball. I mean, my, my wife would have me travel all over the place, and that would be sort of cool. I mean, we get to go – I get to take a vacation this year, October 15th. We're going to bury my mother-in-law, God bless her, in Ireland. So we're going to Ireland, and um, I looked up the – Irish Baseball Federation, and they have a they have a baseball federation. <laughs> like, thing. hey, hey, you need a coach out no, there? No, I'm going to go and visit it. That's yeah. one of my deals. I haven't told my family yet because if I tell them, they're going to get mad, but I'm going to go <laughs> visit them. I'm, I'm, I want to see what they do, right? I started looking at pictures and the whole deal, so I want to I see if I can meet somebody. So if so anybody sees this and has any connections with the Irish Baseball Federation, I'm going to be in Dublin and Belfast. And I would love to come see your 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 stuff. I'm sure we can get you a connection. Maybe some uh, Irish guys want to come play some summer ball in Portland. Hey, you never know because when I told Port and Pickles about it, they said, hey, we want to go play them because they'll take the all-star team like they did uh, a while back when they went to Mexico. Yeah. They, they'd probably go to Ireland to play them. I've heard that they want to travel international yeah. and do a documentary on that also. Well, guess what? There's Somebody in Belfast, get a hold of me. <laughs> Dublin, get a hold of me. We'll make it happen. Yeah, let's do it. Hey, there's your, there's your blog. Yeah, there we go. There you go. Make a cool video out of yep. it. Appreciate you coming on. Great oh. conversation. I'm sure we'll have you on again sometime. I'd love to be. Feel on free to wear your. Feel free to wear your baseball pants next time. You know. I tell you what. I'll, I'll tell you. What, I'll come straight from the stadium next time. There you go. On. But you guys are both welcome, and I'll make sure we get you some pickle gear down here, and we'll bring you some pickle beer. You guys both drink beers. Hey, I tell you what. The pickle beer. I thought it was going to be awful. It is fantastic. Pickle infused beer. Or no, like they, it's, they, it's, 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 they have their own beer. It's not the infused stuff. It's just, yeah, they have their own bar. Yeah, I know. It's, the have, you been, bar. have you been there? I haven't been there yet. Phenomenal. I need to go. Phenomenal. And have the Mag's pizza. The Mag's pizza? Yeah, like a pizza. I like it. Yep. It's named after me. So I, of course I like it, but yeah, I like it. It's good stuff. Their wings are incredible. Uh, there's an upstairs and downstairs and they, uh, there's sports going on over the place. I, I wasn't there, but I heard the championship game. The place went crazy because they had it on all the screens upstairs, downstairs. So pretty cool stuff they do. I mean, we were treated really well by the Portland Pickles. Alan Miller, John Ryan, Scott Barkas, Ross Campbell, uh, Parker, and Cordy. Yeah. They, they're fantastic, man. They treat us well and, and we're excited. And that bar is sweet. The bar is sweet. And the bartender makes a good drink. We'll have to meet up there sometime for sure. Oh, I tell you what, I'll treat. Let's go. Let's do it. Instead of... Uh, so you, you know, come, lunch next week. We'll, Let's just do it down there. We'll go down there. Yeah. We in? We're doing it. Bring your wives. We'll take my oh. wife. She All can right. lie to you guys. Okay. There we go. Yeah. That's, that's another one for you. Get some coaches wives on here. They'll tell you some stories. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Really appreciate your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you, man. You guys be safe and God bless you guys. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. First pitch to Connor Stewart. Swung on. Slow roller to short. Bobble by the shortstop, Rod comes in, the Pickles win, your Pickles are the 2024 West Coast League champions.